Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Milken Institute. Thank you for joining us in the rain. I'm Conrad Kieschel, Director of Communications here at the Institute, and it's a pleasure to have uh, our distinguished author friend, Greg Zuckerman, here for a, what should be a great forum on a subject that many of us are passionate and want to know more about. So we're looking forward to a great discussion between Greg. We're also delighted that our own Joel Kurtzman has agreed to moderate the discussion. So we'll have a great session between the two. Before we start, I want to let people know briefly about some of the forums coming up in the next few months. We have a very busy season before our big global conference. In about, what, two weeks? On February 26th, Institute Senior Fellow Zachary Carabal, a CNBC contributor, will also will join us to explore his latest book, The Leading Indicators. It's a short history of the numbers that rule our world. The very next evening, in a program that just came about in the last week or so, we have our own contribution to pre-Oscar madness. It's a special forum in conjunction with uh, KPCC Southern California Public Radio. KPCC host Larry Mano will moderate a panel delving into the topic that's the subject of an upcoming research report here at the Institute, what California must do to remain competitive in entertainment and keep jobs. And note, if you're interested, this is an evening forum. It will start at 7.30. Okay. On March 6th, Joel Kurtzman will be back again, this time taking on the author role and for his forthcoming book, Unleashing the Second American Century. The Financial Times reviewed the book last week and they said, if you want to feel good about America's future, read Kurtzman. So please don't come to the forum if you want to feel bad about America's future. <laughs> and our final forum for uh, the season is a spiritual one. It's a book, The uh, Path I'm sorry, The Path to Awakening by Shamar Rinpoche, who's one of Tibetan Buddhism's most exalted leaders. That'll be a great event. It's on March 12th. That's the last forum? Last forum before a global conference. Last forum through March. Of course, information about these and the other events, including other forums later in the year, will be found and can be found at milkeninstitute.org. Okay, on to today's event. As many of you have been here before, uh, no, we like to uh, do our Q&A as much as possible digitally. We find that it allows us to get a lot more questions out there and answered. So you'll find on the screens here, and they'll be shown during the discussion, uh, both the way to text and email questions to us. They'll be put on the screens in, in front of Joel and Greg, and uh, we'll get to as many of them as possible. And you can start sending those at any time. After the Q&A is over, you'll have a chance to buy the book from our friends at Barnes & Nobles, and Greg will be here to uh, sign copies. So, Greg Zuckerman is a senior writer at the Wall Street Journal, where he covers big financial trades, hedge funds, and the energy revolution. He's the author of what many consider one of the best books to come out of the financial crisis, and that's The Greatest Trade Ever, centered on hedge fund manager John Paulson. For this book, his latest one, Greg tells me that the title he really wanted to use was not The Frackers, the outrageous inside story of the new billionaire wildcatters, but simply Meet the Frackers. <laughs> so, Greg, you get a chance to at least hear the title. So, please welcome Greg Zuckerman, who will help us meet those frackers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, delighted that you're here, Greg. Uh, I, I loved your book, I have to tell you. Uh, it's fascinating. We're going to get into some of the incredible characters who are leading this transition in the United States and, uh, and what motivates them and, and how they got there. But before we begin that, I want to get, I, I'd like to have slide four, please. Now, if you look at this slide, I think you get a really good idea of what we're talking about. So, in the 1990s, we were importing more than 40, about a little, little less than 40% of our energy. If you look at that figure today, we're importing 14.5% as of last uh, uh, as of last December. That's a remarkable transition, and it reflects the fact that the United States has now gotten access to an enormous amount of energy that was before essentially unrecoverable, 
and it's done it through the typical American mix of ingenuity, entrepreneurship, a little skullduggery, overreaching, people made fortunes, people lost fortunes, but the end product is an enormous shift in the fortunes of the United States. Ultimately, the United States, and I know Greg doesn't like this word, but the United States could become energy independent as a result of this transformation of our resource picture. So I'd like to, to start by asking you, um, so how, how did we get to this point? This is, this is a shift that if you look at the chart, you see has really happened over a very short period of time. How did we get there? So um, in a nutshell, we as a nation went from a desperate situation, as you suggest, just a few years ago. Um, the uh, conventional wisdom is that we were running out of oil and gas in this country. And it was all the experts who believed that. Um, if you talk to the big guys, ExxonMobil, the biggest um, energy company uh, out there, they had given up on, for, for the most part on looking for new areas in the United States. They were going anywhere else. They were going offshore, they were going Africa, they were going Asia. Uh, there was a whole group of people that said, we really couldn't get much production going in the United States. And um, much like, believe it or not, much like the, there are a lot of themes to me similar to the financial meltdown. So when I wrote books about the two of them, and you know, they don't seem very similar, but in some ways to me they are in that the experts got it wrong in both. So if you think about the financial meltdown, who should have anticipated the financial meltdown? It should have been Greenspan, should have been Branke, should have been the heads of all the banks, should have been some of the investors like Jim Chanos as a short seller. All those guys got it wrong and were blindsided. And who got it right? It was a bunch of oddball investors that I write about in, in, in a different book, um, a guy named John Paulson, who was a hedge fund investor, but he knew mergers. He didn't know anything about housing. And he made $20 billion over two years anticipating the meltdown. Um, there was another guy actually locally um, named Jeffrey Green, who was a real estate investor. Uh, and he um, was convinced that the housing market was going to collapse. But he's an unlikely guy also. He um, got married late in life. Uh, best man at his wedding was Mike Tyson. Um, for a while, he had a um, house guest at his home, the uh, uh, Heidi Fleiss, the Hollywood madam. Um, and in other words, not the kind of guy you would have expected to anticipate the financial meltdown. So I write about a bunch of those people in my first book. And I was just struck in this research by who got it right this time and who are the pioneers of this new age, this resurgence. Again, not the people you would have expected. You would have thought ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil, their headquarters literally are on top of the Barnett Shale. The Barnett Shale is, shale is just a rock. I'm sure half the people in this room are experts and half the people don't. Shale is a kind of rock that is the key to this revolution. And ground zero for this resurgence was the Barnett area in Texas. Exxon was sitting on the Barnett, but they couldn't care less. They were going anywhere but the Barnett. Um, Chevron, Chevron should have led this revolution, right? They're big, huge. They started a group um, to do unconventional drilling, and that's what this revolution is about, uh, what you call when you're, when you're targeting shale, this kind of compressed, tough, black rock that people have always kind of not thought would give up that much. Uh, in oil and gas, that's called an unconventional drilling. Shell started a group, and they, they put an up-and-coming executive in, tar in charge of it in the 90s to do this drilling. But people at the, at the firm, people at, at Chevron, they undercut what they were trying to do. They made fun of the people. They stole talent from this group, and they, they, they failed. Again, all the big guys got it wrong. Even the biggest investors got it wrong. Um, one of the biggest, the biggest leverage buyout in history was in 2007. That was of a utility called TXU, and it was basically a bet on natural gas prices going higher because, you know, people oil. Everyone knew that natural gas prices were running out, and natural, and natural, I'm sorry, natural gas supplies were running out in this country, and natural gas prices were going higher. So this, this leverage buyout TXU, it was KKR, it was Goldman Sachs, it was Warren Buffett, it was TPG. All the smart guys were betting on rising natural gas. So they so, all got it wrong. So, so let's talk about who, 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 got it, who got it right. And, so, and, and let's, let's begin with uh, George Mitchell. Exactly. So the first of sort of the oddballs and outsiders uh, and unlikely people, unlikely wildcatters that I write about in my book. George Mitchell um, is the son of a Greek goat herd. Um, his father comes over from Greece. 
Um, he didn't have much of a future in, in Greece. Uh, comes over and they take him off Ellis Island. They throw him to go work on the uh, build the rail system in this country from Arkansas to Texas. Uh, one day the foreman comes. I'm going to uh, butcher his name, so I'm going to read it. I apologize. Um, it's a long uh, Greek name, uh, Savas Paraskopopoulos, and his foreman comes and says, what's with the name? I can't, I can't pronounce this name. I can't spell when I'm writing your checks. So Savas says, well, what's your name? And the guy goes, my name is Mike Mitchell. So he said, all right, I'll be Mike Mitchell. <laughs> so he took his name, and he became Mike Mitchell. And his son is George Mitchell. And George Mitchell started this natural gas company. Uh, and they were in Texas, and, and they did pretty well mid-size. But by the early 80s, they were running out of natural gas. And they didn't have, unlike Exxon, they didn't have offshore acreage. They didn't have acreage in Africa and Asia. So they said, guys, let's go try to drill in this shale layer, this rock that everyone said, all the experts said, yeah, there's a lot of oil and gas in there. It's the source for all the oil and gas that goes, that, that eventually over millions of years goes higher to the surface and we've always kind of vertically uh, drilled and, and tried to find the reservoirs. So shale was down below and everyone gave up on it, but Mitchell didn't have a choice. So he said, guys, let's go figure it out. And by, the, by 1997 or so, there was still failing. And um, by then, George Mitchell had cancer. His wife had early signs of Alzheimer's. Uh, his stock had fallen. He had made all these charitable commitments that he couldn't keep, and it was really embarrassing for the family. Um, but and all they really had was this attempt at finding natural gas uh, in shale. And his own Arab parent, a guy named Bill Stevens, didn't believe what they were doing. And Mitchell was around 80 at that time, so he was day to day. And Bill Stevens was. And Bill Stevens told his guys, "You're wasting your time. Stop. Wait, stop doing so much uh, work on shale." But these guys kept going on. And the, my story is very much a story of, of stubbornness and and, and um, self-confidence, and it's a very American story in some ways. So they finally had a breakthrough um, um, that changed uh, their, country, their company, but also the country and the world. They figured out how so, to get natural gas and, from and, shale. And, and what was that breakthrough, and, and what did it do? It was lucky in some ways. Um, what happened was they were fracking. So fracking, again, half the people in this room, I'm sure, know what it is, other people don't. Um, fracking just really means uh, to simplify it, pummeling rock, often the shale, this kind of difficult uh, to produce rock, uh, pummeling it with a combination of liquids, some concoction. And they always played with it over the years. And we've been fracking since the 50s. Um, and, and by pummeling, you mean shooting it with a high pressure liquid. Right? Exactly. And the whole idea okay. is to create little fissures, little fractures in the rock that allow oil and gas to get out of there, to, to be produced and to come out the uh, well up to the surface. So they were fracking in, in Texas, this shale. And one day, and, and again, they had this concoction. And most, it was water with sand and, and foam and, and chemicals. And one day, their contractor, Schlumberger, I believe it was, made a mistake. And they used much too much water in this concoction. And this well actually produced a pretty good amount of, of, of natural gas. And the guy in charge, this guy Nick Steinsberger, a young guy, said, all right, we, you know, we pre produce a good amount of, of natural gas, and it's cheaper with a lot of water. Let's keep going with it. And everyone said, what are you doing? You're, you're, it's, a, it's a one off. It's a fluke. Uh, you're an idiot. You're going to lose your job. Um, people were in, in insulting to him to his face, behind his back. Um, his wife was worried that we're going to have to move. And back then, in the late 90s, no one cared about, if you remember, but no one cared about energy. It was, you know, tech boom. And um, he was worried about having to leave the industry. But he played with it, and he and, and his team and, played with and it. And when they cared about energy, they cared we were running out of it. Exactly. But um, Steinsberger and his colleagues figured it out over that year or so, um, the way to get to, to frack. And, and produce and get a good amount of natural gas from the shale layer. And again, they, they, they changed the, their company. They eventually sold just a couple years later uh, the company, and George Mitchell uh, walked away with a few billion dollars. Uh, the guys in the fields, and I wrote a lot of the book is really dedicated to those guys in the fields who um, innovate and create. And you know, our country gets all kinds of criticism for not innovating anymore. So, so how much bonus did Stein, uh, what was his, how do you pronounce his so name? I'm, I'm a Wall Street guy, so I'm used to hedge fund guys reward their people. They, they, they get paid way too much money, but they do share it. Um, so, and, and in my first book, um, the, the guy who, who helped John Paulson made $175 million that year. This guy, Nick Steinsberger, made about $100,000, $150,000 that year, even though he changed the world. He really changed the world with this concoction, both for good and for bad. We can talk about the bad as well. Um, but and, and, but uh, he got very little. So those guys figured it out. They sold the company. They proved you can get a lot of natural gas from shale by fracking it in this one area of Texas. But even at, by then, people were still were a little skeptical. They said, well, OK, George, good job in Texas. But who's to say you can get anything from shale elsewhere? So it took other people to, to prove that. That was a long answer.
So, so <laughs> let's, let's have uh, slide seven, please. So, so if, can we have it on the monitor here as well? Um, if you see slide seven, uh, this is the fluid you're talking about. Yep, it's a variation of what Nick Steinsberger came up with. And, and can you explain what's going on here? So it's actually more than 90%, 90, 90%. it's about 95 or more uh, percent water is this concoction and you add um, sand, um, that's to prop up in these, these the fractures, uh, and chemicals and um, it's a little bit proprietary and, and people in the industry have always said um, it's our secret sauce so we're not going to tell you what's, uh, what chemicals we use and it's been disturbing for many in this country and rightfully so. Um, you know, one of the things I, I found from my project is I kind of went into this project thinking that the average guy in this business, the average fracker, is sort of like this Houston boardroom kind of guy chomping on a cigar and giggling his way to the bank um, while he's spilling and, and left and right. And, um, <laughs> you know, that was sort of the impression I have. I'm an East Coast guy and I'm a reporter. Um, and the more I talk to these people, the more I realize that um, they're not, you know, um, um, do-gooders. They're not out to save the world. Although some of them have this feeling they really want to move America towards energy independence. But they're also not bad people. They, um, they're outdoorsmen. They're geologists often. They like rock. They hunt. They fish. Um, they are outdoors more than I am. I'm sitting at my desk most of the time. So um, they're not bad people. They're not, again, good people. But they're not out to pollute. So they didn't want to give up their secret sauce. They said, I, we spent years working on this thing, the right chemicals to get natural gas and oil out of shale. So I'm going to tell people about it. But finally, they realized that you know we uh, in this country are a little nervous about these chemicals. Well, some of them are fine, but some of them you really don't want to ingest. And, and if you look at this, uh, some of it is salt, some of it's ethanol. There, there are lots of things, and, and they called it slick fluid. And what, slick what water. does that slick mean? Slick water. Can it just means he water heavy, like Nick Steinsberg came up with, as much as 90%, I'm sorry, 99% water with some chemicals and with some um, sand added. And everyone has a little different variation. And now they're disclosing more of the chemicals that they're using. Not enough, I would argue, and there's still exceptions. But um, in most states or many states, they're finally owning up to exactly what they're putting into their, uh, their concoctions, their cocktails. So, so let's have slide two, please. So, so this is uh, kind of a cross-section of a fracking well. Can you explain what's, uh, what's going on here? Well, so, yeah, I mean, um, the key here, there are two keys. We all talk about fracking, and my book is The Frackers, but um, there are two legs to this revolution. The first is fracking, again, the pummeling, um, as you all said, with high pressure, this, this concoction, this cocktail, to loosen up and create little fractures. But the key also is how we're drilling down vertically, and then we, they, turn, they figured out how to turn the drill bit 90 degrees and go horizontally. And that's because there are a lot of these formations in this country, shale formations and other, that are really long and narrow. And the only way to get at them is to drill horizontally. And um, you know, I, I was saying, saying earlier, our country gets a lot of criticism for not innovating anymore. And I'm on the coast, the east coast, you guys on the west coast, and that is sort of the, the common wisdom. But when you get out in the middle of the country, and I had the real privilege of, of traveling this wonderful country to um, Louisiana and Texas and Oklahoma and, and North Dakota and Pennsylvania and talking to people in the fields and talking to individuals who have this happening in their backyard, you see a real innovation, technological innovation. It's a story of technology, uh, the frackers, in some ways. So they figured out before anyone in the rest of the world, the rest of the world hasn't come close to catching up, and we could talk about why, but they figured out how to drill horizontally, and that's the key there, and, to, uh, and, and, and that's the way to combine the two. When you combine the two, then we were off to the races and, and things, production took off. So, so now Sanford Devoren was, was one of the fellows in your book who figured out this uh, cross uh, drilling, so the horizontal drilling, is that correct? Yeah, but he's among those who, and so, so for every billionaire I write about, there's another guy who had the same idea really early. And what happened to? But Clint Paul, so Sanford Devoren is the son of a butcher from Newark. Um, he moves out to Texas. He's an odd, interesting, smart, quirky guy. I'm sort of attracted to those people in my writing. Um, and he said, I'm going to go find oil in um, an urban area around the airport now uh, in, 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 in Fort Worth area. And people scoffed. They made fun of him. He was out there like 
literally um, feeding, he was really nice to his, his workers. He was giving them like whitefish salad and, and bagels. He found bagels somehow. Um, um, the guy from, from Newark, you know, he liked his bagels. So he found some in Texas. This is years ago. Anyway, he was really early, but he just couldn't pull it off. So for, for George Mitchell's the, the success story and the billionaire, but Devorn, you, you know, read in the book, I don't want to tell too much of it, but uh, he basically, it's very, it's sad in some ways because he had the same ideas and the acreage he believed in in Texas later was worth hundreds of millions of dollars and he had it, but he had to give it up and uh, it just didn't work out. So what's he doing now? He's still, still hoping. A lot of these guys, it's, a, it's an American archetype, this um, wildcatter um, career and this yearning. So there's an individual we could talk about named Harold Hamm in my book. Who, and um, he really personifies it. They just hunger to find oil. They, they, it's in their blood. They want to be famous. They want to make a lot of money. And I'm a capitalist. Um, I work at the Wall Street Journal, so I better be. Um, uh, so, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing to, to, to try to make a lot of money. And they really, um, they, they wanted to, and, and they want to find a lot of oil. So Sanford's still hoping to, to find, make his, you know, make his score, make his make Now, his now you talk about mineral rights as one of the differentiators. So there are the incentives. And explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so we... I thought, when I started this project, I thought that, okay, the first leg, the first chapter, as it were, is America, and then the next is the rest of the world, because they've got more than we do in shale, oil, and gas. Um, Argentina, Mexico, UK, Poland, uh, China, Russia. And then the more work I did it, uh, I realized that we've got a remarkable number of advantages over the rest of the world. And one of them, as Joel suggested, is the fact that we are the, one of the only countries where we own our own mineral rights underneath us. Um, my backyard, I could lease it to a, an oil and gas company. And um, that's what happened. They, entrepreneurs approached um, individuals, they worked out deals, and it accelerated the process. We have other advantages too. Uh, we have more access to, to fresh water than other people. We've mapped the geology. Um, our formations aren't as deep as some places like China, and they're not near earthquake prone areas like there other areas. We've got more rigs, we've got capital markets. I can go on. Um, can we have but, a slide five, please? <laughs> go on. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, so mineral rights, as Joel suggested, are one key reason why we have the revolution and others do. And I was in London just a few weeks ago, and you can make the argument, and I will make the argument, that they should be fracking, but um, it's hard to convince an individual that, because they're not going to be rewarded and, and, by it. And just to explain, this map that's oh. up there is the opportunities to frack around the world. So you can see it's quite widespread, and it's pretty democratically distributed. But as you say, the, the, the U.S. is decades ahead. Yeah, in some ways, the good guys really have a lot of uh, shale. I like, uh, it's, it's, uh, in some ways, uh, you know, Poland's become our friends, and um, the U.K., and um, Argentina, Mexico. Uh, so, uh, you know, Russia has a lot, but still. Um, China has a lot. So if you care about global warming like I do, uh, and if you're worried about global warming like I do, you really got to hope that China embraces fracking. I know it sounds crazy, but um, the, we can't make a dent, unfortunately, into, in, 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 the, um, in, in, in terms of combating global warming in the United States. And Europe really can't. The only thing we can do is try to get China to stop um, um, progressing in, in terms of its uh, um, reliance on, on coal. And the only way they can do that is they can start figuring out their own geology and start fracking and shifting at least at the margin, to natural gas from coal. So I'm hoping that they do take off. And I know guys are going off to China and, and trying to make it happen there, so hopefully that does happen. But what are, so what are some of the other advantages that the U.S. has? Uh, because we, we are the first that are doing it, and if you remember back to that first chart, we've, we've really accelerated. Um, I think one of the figures you have is that we went from uh, pro producing 5 million to 9 million barrels of oil in a two-year yeah. period as a result of fracking. And just to put that in perspective, that four million barrels that we ended up producing, that's equal to the entire amount Japan uses in a day. So we've essentially, in that two-year period, added the equivalent of a Japan to our, to our production. Um, and and that's, that's significant. So what, what are some of the other ways in which we Accomplish well, that. there are things we can point to, um, such as access to fresh water. Um, use a lot of water when it comes to fracking. Um, use about five million uh, gallons uh, per well, and um, uh, we still have it. We, we can talk about the issues, especially in California, and they are 
um, significant issues in terms of um, using fresh water. Um, but others, other countries just don't have as much as we do. Um, pipelines, we've got an uh, advanced pipeline system in this country that other people don't have. Um, capital markets. Those are things you can point to, but you can also point to, I think there's some um, cultural issues. Um, it's hard to, you know, I'm a, I, I scientifically point to them, but, um, or, or define them, but there's this, um, 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 er, we've got entrepreneurs, and we encourage entrepreneurs, and we don't mind if they make a lot of money in this country, as long as they do it properly and, and, and legally. So um, that encourages people to, the Sanford Dworn and George Mitchell and, and the other people, Harold Hamm, the other people I write about, to try new ideas and innovate. And they continue to innovate. If you talk to these people in the field, they're, they're coming up with new formations and new ways to drill more efficiently. Um, it's kind of interesting and kind of impressive. Now, you, you, you mentioned in, in, in the book about George Mitchell it, precisely on that point. So if he had eight or ten wells he was going to drill, he knew which ones in advance were the most likely producers, and he left those for last. That was early on in his career when he was trying to keep his investors happy. So he would always keep one uh, to the side uh, in case he needed one that he thought was pretty going to produce. So if he was striking out, striking out. It's a fascinating um, world, wildcatting, because you've got to convince investors about something that's way down below the ground, that something looks promising and you're going to be able to get a lot of oil and gas. You have to be really out, outgoing, a good salesman, charismatic, uh, a good uh, spiel. Um, but, but, um, and he, he had that. So yeah, but, but later on when it came to, to shale, it, it was much, much harder for him. So now, um, if you go back to, uh, to the, the, the map slide five, and, and you look at this, and you say all these places have large deposits of oil and gas, there are geopolitical consequences as, as a result. I mean, if you look at the Middle East, it's just another stop in the neighborhood. The rest of the world has an enormous supply of energy. How, how do you think that, that could play out? It's a really good question. So I talked to military leaders, ex-military leaders, um, political officials, and the, the, the economic impact of this revolution is really clear already. 1% uh, to GDP, 2 million jobs potentially, um, manufacturing industry is adding jobs, and there's a reshoring in, in a lot of industries, uh, construction and um, I mean chemicals. I'm sorry, and tires and, and fertilizer and, and those which uh, natural gas input. So those you can you can point to in, in the jobs and little towns in America that are having a, a rebirth. But the geopolitical impact, I think people are only starting to think about. So I and I think there's already an impact. So um, you know, a few a couple months ago, we told Saudi Arabia we're not going to get involved with Syria. And I think part of it is because we don't care as much what Saudi Arabia thinks. And I think um, we can do things like boycott the Iranian oil, and it won't have an impact, and didn't, hasn't had much of an impact on global oil, thanks in part to the, the frackers. Um, going forward, there are going to be all kinds of interesting um, scenarios you can, you can spin out. So we, we right now import about 7%. About we use about 7% of Middle East oil in our imports. Um, that's going to drop. So what happens when China is much more dependent on the Middle East than we are? And that's going to happen. And do we want China to become more involved? I mean, we keep losing young people. We keep spending billions getting involved in the Middle East and wars. Um, I think at the margin, we are going to pivot away from the Middle East. And you already saw that when Hillary was um, Secretary of State. And if she wins in a few years, you're going to see more of that. She really led that rethinking to the pivot towards Asia. It's not to say the Middle East won't be important as long as oil is important. And, and we have allies there. The Middle East will be important. But at the margin, I think it will be less important to the United States than the Middle East. I think this last effort by Kerry to um, um, try to work out a, a peace deal in, in, in uh, the Middle East between Palestinians and Israel might be a last gasp for us in some ways. Um, these are interesting scenarios. Then what happens? Do we, do we want China to become more involved in the Middle East? Um, do, we, do we not want that? You know, I talk to different people. Some people say that's a little scary, China building up their military. Other people say the goal of, of the Chinese leadership is just to stay in power. So if they contribute a little bit and help us and pay some of the bill to keep the Middle East safe, uh, the Straits of Hormuz and otherwise, that's not a bad thing. I don't have great answers there, but it's, it's interesting stuff. So, so if we look at slide six, and we'll get a, a sense here of just what we're talking about in terms of the overview of the United States and its position with regard to energy in the future. Now, this is not realized yet, and this includes coal, which is very dirty, uh, but it's all forms of energy. And if you look at that, this was produced by the Congressional Research Service. If you look at this chart, this is a whole, no one, I, I don't think anyone 
could have predicted this chart even a decade ago. But if you look at where it is, the U.S. is number one. Now, interestingly enough, the last time this happened, the U.S. was a creditor country to the world. Uh, Texas was the equivalent of OPEC. Uh, we funded uh, countries. The, the flow of funds into the U.S. was large surpluses. Do you think we're, we're, we have the possibility of recreating that kind of scenario, Greg? Yeah, listen, I'm um, of the viewpoint that you have in your your really interesting new book that- Thank um, you. Sure. <laughs> Available at Amazon.com. <laughs> um, that we really have, we, this is an, an era we've started of American um, dominance. It's not to say a boom in America. I'm not, um, I'm not unaware of the uh, new normal we're in, coined by some people not too far from here. But um, w relative to other countries, we've got real advantages. We pay uh, a third to a half of what um, Europe and, and Asia do in terms of natural gas costs, despite the, the blip recently. Um, and um, yeah, the only thing about this chart is, they were, if you look at charts you know, back in 2006 or so, they were really skeptical about our, how, mu how much we have in terms of hydrocarbons. So uh, you want to take a little, a little bit of a grain of salt, but right now it looks great. And this was December 2012 when this chart uh, was released. So, so now if we get back to some of the entrepreneurship behind this, because w one of the interesting things, actually one of the fascinating things about your book uh, is the people and, and the fact that you pay so much attention to how the struggles. I mean, none of these, uh, you, you mentioned Harold Hamm. Now, Harold Hamm didn't have a clear path. What, what was his background like? And 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 uh, he he now has what 13, 14 billion dollars. So Harold Hamm is a fascinating guy. He started off just dirt poor, a little town in Oklahoma. Um, he was one of thirteen children. He um, was so poor he never had a new pair of shoes. He didn't have a new pair of shoes until his little shack of a home burned down, and the neighbors all contributed, and he got a new pair of shoes. It became like a po good event. Really, a, he remembers it as a positive event when his home burned down. Um, <laughs> uh, Harold Hamm was so poor that he um, he's one of thirteen. As I said, they all helped their parents. They were sharecroppers, their parents, and they uh, picked watermelon and. Um, cotton in the fields and they throughout the, the, the Southwest, and they could only start school each year until by around Christmas time because only then was it so cold um, that they weren't needed in, in the field. So the guy was dirt poor. He didn't go to college, but he had this hunger, as I suggested earlier, this hunger to find oil, oil, and and to make his mark on the world and to change this country. And um, he started off. Uh, he didn't go to college and didn't know anything about geology and drilling or engineering, but he started off cleaning out um, tanks. Um, he literally took a long rake and scooped out the sediment from the bottom of tanks and was, did that. He did a little water transport and he started saving some money and started doing um, some wildcatting uh, in oil in Oklahoma. And then um, he learned about how much promise there was uh, up north, up in Montana, then up North Dakota. They headed up there and they said, guys, we're going to go try to find a lot of oil. And those are areas where very much are boom and bust areas, historically always have been. And they made progress and they got really excited about this formation called the Bakken Formation uh, up in North Dakota. And um, they made a big bet on it. They got more acreage than anybody else. Um, but it, they really didn't have much success. But it recently, as recently as 2005 or so, they tried to sell at least half of their acreage. And again, the big guys couldn't care less, and the middle guys didn't want it either. Um, but they, they, they kept working at it. And it's a, and it's a story of, of innovation, but it's also just stubbornness and um, trial and error. And they kept working, and they kept combining horizontal drilling and fracking. And they finally got a nice surge, real surge going. Um, in the Bakken area. It's just an unbelievably fascinating time, area if you ever want to check it out. And um, yeah, they finally got so much going that, yeah, he's worth $14 billion today. He's worth more than um, the estate of Steve Jobs, more than Rupert Murdoch. He's so wealthy that he's going through a, a divorce, unfortunately, right now. Um, don't worry too much. He's um, Supposedly, he's got a new girlfriend, so I wouldn't care too much about him. Um, supposedly, sources tell me. And, um, but, he, um, but his wife is going to walk away with more money than Oprah Winfrey. So <laughs> he's a real, yeah. So, and, and again, people, don't, no, people haven't really focused on this revolution as much as they could have been. So he's one of the richest men in America, and most people never heard of the guy. So um, as, as, you, um, as you, you were up in, in the Bakken area, what is that like? I, uh, from what we hear episodically or NPR profiles of it, 
we hear stories that you can't find places to live, that uh, anyone who goes up there can make very good money. Is it a, does, does it have the sense of a, of a gold rush, land rush? Not too many people named Zuckerman up there, I'll tell you that much. Um, <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's, a fast, it's a fascinating place. It's, literally, it's one of the most fascinating places I've ever been to in my life. It's um, a mag, so the city of Williston is, just a ma is, is like the epicenter of this whole thing. I don't know if anyone's ever been up there. It's, it's really, if you're ever up in North Dakota, you should check it out. Um, it's, it's fascinating because um, it's the only reason to be there is to make money. It's like a new gold rush. It's really hot in the summer. Uh, it's ugly. In the, in the winter, it's unbelievably cold. And yet, people come from all over the country there to remake their lives. And I give these people a lot of credit. A lot of them are, don't want to be on the dole. They've got debt. They move from places like Oregon and, and even Pennsylvania. They get in a truck and they move up there. And you can get jobs. Unemployment's around 3%. Uh, the problem is real estate is ridiculously expensive. It's like a Manhattan. You can get a three-bedroom for like 3600 a, a month. Um, um, in, in church, there was a church, and they were preaching that um, a member, um, people shouldn't gouge neighbors, shouldn't gouge neighbors. It's, it's in some ways, it's 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 been great for them, um, but in some ways, it's it, it hasn't. It's really transformed the area. Um, it's a, there's been a rebirth. You really a lot of these towns in the in the Bakken were dying out, and young people were moving away, and now they're moving back. And people who own lands have made a lot of money, um, and people who have jobs and have um, housing have done really well. But other people um, haven't done too well. The crime is up. Um, if you've got young women, I've talked to all kinds of families and, and such, and they, they feel a little uncomfortable because there are a lot of men there. There are a lot of, uh, I, I stayed in a man camp there. Um, and uh, it's actually- and, and what's a man camp? Man camp is where the workers uh, live. It's, um, it's short-term rentals. It's, you get a room with a, um, it's, it's very clean, and it's, it's a little bit like a combination of, of uh, it's like a university almost, being in a dorm. You share the bathroom, you, but you've got like a, a flat screen TV, a little room, flat screen TV, clean. They give you some food. Um, they're very, most, most of the people, they're not kind of redneck, um, you know, uneducated people. Nowadays, you have to be um, a little more sophisticated, a little more educated. I don't want to go overboard, a little more educated uh, to be working <laughs> in the field. So um, these people, they're not violent, but there can be violence. You know, put a lot of men together. Um, you're not supposed to bring alcohol and, and, um, and uh, firearms into the man camp. They're, so you, I didn't feel unsafe, but it's a fascinating place. So, so now, now let's talk a, about uh, the guy who might be the most colorful uh, person in, in the industry, Aubrey McClendon, who uh, a couple of years ago was at the Global Conference, I, I might add. Um, talk a little bit about what he uh, was trying to do, how he developed his company, uh, Chesapeake, and why he chose the name Chesapeake when it was based in Oklahoma. Hmm. Well, I'll talk about him and I'll talk about his partner. He teamed up with a guy named Tom Ward. Okay. Um, so Aubrey McClendon um, is from a town in Oklahoma. And he, uh, Oklahoma City, he um, grew up pretty well off, not um, um, wealthy, but pretty well off. He came from the Kerr-McGee family, um, oil gas family, not the right side of the Kerr-McGee family, but pretty well off side of it. Um, and he wasn't a guy, and this, this is the theme of unusual people leading this revolution. He wasn't a guy that uh, ached and yearned to find oil and gas. He went to Duke, he majored in history. Um, you know, an interesting family. His, uh, a relative is uh, Kate Upton, the model. Anybody here know Kate Upton? Um, okay, good. Um, so he's got an interesting family, and not kind of an oil family per se, except for that Kerr McGee um, side um, link. And he um, came out of school and decided to be a landsman. A landman is somebody who uh, goes to individuals and homeowners, um, farmers, etc., and, and tries to work out a deal um, for their employer to lease their lands. And you have to be charismatic, you have to be outgoing. That's what um, Arbery is. He's a remarkably outgoing, impressive, charismatic guy in a lot of ways. He feel, a lot of people compare him to Bill Clinton. When you're with him, you feel like you're the only person he cares about, the only person in the world. He cares about you, how are you doing? He asks your opinion. He's a really interesting, outgoing guy. And he hooked up with a guy named Tom Ward, who came from the other side of the tracks in, in a little town in Oklahoma. Um, Tom Ward, um, his grandfather was an alcoholic. A notorious alcoholic, and his father was an alcoholic, and women in that town were warned not to um, marry into the to the Ward family. Um, but Ward found religion, literally, and it stabilized him, and he became a landman too. And he and, and Tom decided to hook up, and they started um, Chesapeake Energy. And Chesapeake was just started because. Um, he liked that, um, um, Aubrey liked that part of the Chesapeake Bay and, and, uh, a of the area. In other words, it's not an oil and gas kind of name. It's Chesapeake Bay. He thought it was pretty, and he, he named it after it. 
Um, and also because they didn't think the company would last, so they wanted to name it after something that wasn't like McClendon and Ward kind of ink or something. <laughs> um, and for a while, it didn't look like they were going. They were, they were ups and downs, and they almost um, crashed, and they crashed and burned, and they rose. And Tom Ward, and they eventually uh, were the, very early in realizing that George Mitchell um, figured out how to get natural gas from shale, but that, that technology could be applied elsewhere around the country into other shale formations. So we have them all over the country, and I think we have one slide that'll, that'll show that. And McClendon and Ward and Chesapeake, they raced all over the country to lease land. At one point, uh, Chesapeake had so much land, it was the equivalent of three times the size of, of the state of New Jersey. Um, and, but they also, so they, and, and they produced a, a lot of natural gas, but so we, have, we have them to thank in a lot of ways uh, for how little we pay relative to others and relative to what we could be paying for natural gas. But they also missed some of the biggest lessons of the past few years. One is not to have too much leverage. And they leveraged up, they had this real outsized appetite in a lot of ways, and they bought too many of their own shares. Their company had too much leverage. They got, they bought too much, they leased too much land. Uh, you read about in the book, but eventually they crashed and burned, but they're starting all over again. So just by comparison, when you think of uh, the competition between countries, the U.S. Uh, prices for natural gas are approximately plus or minus four dollars a thousand cubic feet. Uh, they're sixteen dollars right now in Japan about 14, 12 to 14 in Europe. So there's a tremendous advantage that the U.S. has in terms of this. You can use it for fuel, you can use it for chemicals, you can use it to run factories, heat houses. So, so it, it's really part of the infrastructure and its, and its cost is a quarter in some cases uh, compared to that of, of our uh, competitors, uh, economic competitors. But the, I, I'm sure the main question many people have here is, well, is, is this safe? Is this something we should be doing? Uh, and, and you mentioned a little bit about the environment that, um, that you hope uh, China begins to frack, but talk a little bit about the safety concerns, and I'm sure when we have questions uh, and, and answers, there'll be more questions about this. Sure, so I come down, uh, my view is that both sides in the argument really overstate um, um, their views and overstate their arguments, and I'll explain why. First, I'll explain why. Uh, so you have one side saying fracking's poisons, fracking poisons, we shouldn't do any fracking. The other side says drill, baby, drill. And first, I'll tell you why um, the fracking poisons guys are overstating their argument. Um, the three, I'll, I'll simplify the three key concerns when it comes to fracking. The first is methane getting into the water. We've all probably seen movies where you turn on the faucet, light a match, and there's a fireball, and it's pretty disturbing stuff. Um, the second is that chemicals, these chemicals we mentioned are getting into the water, and you don't want to be ingesting a lot of those chemicals. And the third are, are earthquakes or, or, or tremors. Um, the, I'll, ta I'll tackle each of them. Um, the first, in terms of methane, methane does get into the water in this country, all over the country. The problem is it's unlikely to be because of fracking. Um, I traveled to Dimmick, um, which is uh, ground zero for the protesters, and I talked to old timers there. And they said, Greg, we used to turn on the faucet in school early, get there early, light a match and run for it and blow it up. And um, it's because <laughs> there happens to be naturally um, natural gas, um, um, methane gets into the water. It's shallow in some areas of this country, not everywhere, and it gets into the water. There are three towns in this country named Burning Springs. Uh, Burning Springs, Kentucky, West Virginia, and New York, and, and the Native Americans used to sometimes light on fire. So naturally, methane sometimes gets into the water. So um, there are mistakes, and I'll get to them in a second, but often um, that concern is really overstated because it's natural, um, um, the methane that gets into the water. The second issue are chemicals getting into the water. And um, you, when you talk to scientists who are objective, um, in other words, those that see mistakes that the oil and gas guys make and yet um, have done studies and um, are at reputable universities, et cetera, um, they say it's possible that the chemicals will get into the water, but it's unlikely, uh, largely because we're drilling so far below the surface, uh, as much as 14,000 feet almost uh, in some areas of the country, and the water um, reservoir is about 400 feet. So it's possible that you're drilling so, so down below and the chemicals somehow will get higher, um, but it's unlikely when you talk to just objective scientists. Um, and the third are the issue of, of earthquakes and tremors. There really aren't earthquakes, there are tremors, and sometimes you feel them and sometimes you don't. I shouldn't 
you know, be light about earthquakes here in uh, Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, when you, when you, it, the issue isn't fracking, per se. It's re-injecting the wastewater that comes up. You have to do something with it, and you re-inject it into the ground. And the industry is getting a little better at, at doing the geology and figuring out where they should be injecting it and where they shouldn't. Um, it's not to say they're where they should be yet, but um, they're making progress. The other side, though, the industry overstates. They say, oh, we've been fracking since the 50s. Don't worry about it. Um, and the truth of the matter is we have been, but not in shale. And shale is very different. It's much high pressure, as Joel suggested. So we don't have that much data. We have relatively we have much less data about fracking, about fracking in shale. So that's a concern. And it's also the case that these guys, they spill all the time. They leak. Um, the cement, the key is the cement and, and the surrounding of the, the wells. And as long as that stays um, stable and firm um, and, 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 and we, we can count on that, that's fine. But I've seen different data. One in 10 times the wells, um, the casing has to be remediated, however one defines that, and that's really disturbing. So there are states, um, I am encouraged that people are starting to make some progress and put pressure. I'm a big believer, I'm, I'm very much a centrist, I've gotten criticized from both sides. There are a couple of key characters in my book that won't talk to me anymore. Um, um, people like New York Times and others don't like that I say nice things about fracking. I, I take a little bit from both sides, but I'm okay with that, and um, I, I believe that we should be working with the oil and gas companies. because. We need, first, first of all, 90% of wells right now are fracked. So to say, oh, we're not, we shouldn't do any fracking in this country, and we're not yet, unfortunately, we're not yet ready to, to depend on wind uh, and on solar. And a lot of guys are working on it. I think we are going to get there. I'm a big believer in incremental progress, just like the Mitchell guys. I think the same thing will happen with alternatives. But we're not there yet. So let's work with the oil and gas companies and make sure they do a better job of producing uh, natural gas and oil. There are a few groups that will do that. Um, EDF is one, Environmental Defense Fund. And they get a lot of flack from the left. But um, they're willing to work with companies like ExxonMobil. And now the big guys, remember I said the big guys made fun of all this drilling. They've raced back to America. Now they're the forefront of this drilling, um, Exxon paid $41 billion for XTO, one of the pioneers. So they don't want the PR hits, and they understand that people are really worried about what's, what's going on out there. So increasingly, they're working with states in, in Colorado, California, um, Wyoming, um, and North Dakota. They've got better laws um, just in the last um, couple, few months, which to me as a centrist is encouraging. I hope there's more pressure. I, I, would, I want to bring more pressure on the oil and gas companies to improve the way uh, they operate. And, and just quickly, how, how about the atmosphere, the effect on the atmosphere? Yeah, no, there are issues. There are um, concerns. Uh, Texas, um, the ozone layer. Um, I've been really concerned. I have some real concerns about the workers. I think down the road, they're going to be just like the asbestos issues now. They're going to be um, the, the um, sand gets lodged in the throat and it's going to be a real issue. Um, so there are issues there. And, you know, it's like any other drilling. You have to be, you know, people sometimes have this real criticism of fracking, but it's really they're, they're criticizing drilling in general. Um, they just kind of, of fracking is kind of sexy, and you can you can get people excited about it. But um, often it's just criticism of, of drilling, and these towns are being transformed for good or for bad. Um, there's traffic now, and there's air pollution. Uh, it's noisy; it can be smelly. Um, so I understand why people won't necessarily want it in their backyards. So so let's go to the questions. And and by the way, you can still send your questions uh, to the addresses that are up there. Uh, but the first question is, can you please give us your view on the future of Monterey Shale in California? Yeah, so when, when you talk to people in the industry about Monterey Shale, they're excited about it, but they're a little skeptical. Um, obviously, water is a real issue here. And when it comes to water in this country, we really haven't had a conversation, and we really need to, um, about water usage. So fracking uses a lot of water, but relative to farming, it's just minuscule. Um, I've seen some data showing that um, it's just um, the total water use for fracking is equivalent to just a couple of days of, of farming in this country, and we still need to do farming, but supposedly they say there's some wasted water there. Um, golf courses take a lot of water, too. So we need to have a conversation. We increasingly have to. But yeah, for the Monterey Shale, that, that is troublesome in terms of the, the water usage, and a lot of it is local when it comes to fracking and, and shipping water. I am encouraged that there are a couple of companies working, Apache, working on recycling water, and that would help in terms of the Monterey Shale. And obviously in terms of the... Uh, the uh, earthquake and tremor issues, um, they have to do a lot of research ahead of time. Governor Brown seems to um, ha do, be doing a good job, kind of going down the middle, talking to both sides. Um, um, I know there's some activists that have gotten his ear lately, so we'll see what happens. So uh, another question, if salt is added to the fracking process, why isn't salty seawater used instead of fresh? I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if it added, I don't think salting itself is added. A lot, a lot of it anyway. A lot of it comes back up. 
But I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert there. Okay, so we haven't solved that problem, but uh, we're working <laughs> on it. Um, how will this energy surplus reduce or decrease inflationary pressures in the United States? It'll help the dollar at the margin. You don't want to go overboard. There are a lot of factors in the dollar, but it's going to help the dollar. As we, and, and you write about in your book, as we import a lot of less um, energy from abroad and we start exporting both natural gas and maybe even crude, it's a crazy thing, you know? I remember being in the backseat of my parents' car in the early 70s when the Arab boycott and being on a long line for, for gas. And now we're thinking about exporting crude. It's crazy. Anyway, as we do that, it's going to help the dollar. Um, it's going to help the trade deficit. Um, and if the dollar is strengthened, that's going to help um, against inflation. Not that we have inflation. Some people would want some more inflation in this country. So that's a different conversation. You say that China needs to frack to get off their dependence on coal, but it seems that the Chinese are trying to leapfrog fossil fuels entirely and go to solar and other renewables. Do you think that won't, won't work? It's not that it won't work. It's they're going to need, they're going to need everything. We're all going to. That's part of my argument, too. We need every kind of energy source. Um, we're going to need some coal, unfortunately, um, especially Europe, because they're not fracking. So we're, you know, we're actually we're literally exporting coal. Uh, to, we're sending coal to Newcastle, to the UK. It's crazy concept. I was over there. It's a fascinating thing. Um, they, they don't want to frack, but they're okay you know, importing, shipping. shipping. Uh, it's not great for the environment. And then burning our coal. Um, so um, China's going to need to do all, we're all going to need to do all, we're all going to do, we're going to need renewables and we're going to need uh, solar and we're going to improve there and um, it's going to be the entrepreneurs, it's not going to be the cylinders in the government, it's going to be uh, guys like Tesla I think and um, other entrepreneurial companies and that in China, you know, different system, hopefully um, they also can make some uh, um, progress in all, all those sources. Uh, there was a fair amount of controversy at the beginning of the Bush administration around White House meetings with oil executives. What was the Bush-Cheney influence on the growth of fracking in the U.S.? It, it pretty much took off during that administration. Yeah, but it wasn't thanks to them. You could argue, I guess the industry was helped because Cheney didn't, uh, Cheney allowed them to, um, to not reveal all the chemicals, but that was more like a PR hit anyway. I'm not sure how much it helped them much. It actually would have been better how they revealed it and not cause this, this black eye for the industry. Bush, you know, Bush is the big oil man. You know, I, I quote him in my book in, I don't know when it was, uh, at some point late in his administration, talking about how, we, how we're running out of oil in, in this country. And he's the one who started moving um, the requirements for, for automobiles in this country, and, and thankfully so. And, and, and Obama's pushed it much higher. It's up to, gonna be up to 50 miles per gallon. So. Um, those meetings, yeah, I don't know. Those, those are all executives that, that they met with. None of them were in my book. None of those guys in my book. They weren't the pioneers of this era of energy. They were the exons of the world. They were anywhere but. So I guess it was about, they must have been talking about more tax breaks or something. Okay. <laughs> so, so which uh, American companies are leading fracking efforts overseas? Uh, one is a company called EOG, which I write about in my, comp in my book. Um, Mark Papa started uh, or led that company. And, they're formerly um, Enron Oil and Gas, but Enron ha had nothing to do wanted nothing to do with those guys because they were actually, oh, God forbid, they were actually looking for oil and gas, not just trading it and trying to make money doing that like Enron was doing. So um, they were the first to scoop up all this acreage in the Eagleford, um, or one of the first, but they scooped up a lot of acreage in the Eagleford, which is in Texas, about an hour and a half from San Antonio, and they're at the forefront in Argentina and some other places as well. There are other companies too. And you mentioned, uh, by the way, about the environment uh, issue. I'd just like to come back to that for a second as well, because the, um, in the U.S., in your book, you, you suggest that we are uh, emitting a lot less CO2 into the atmosphere, but that Europe, with much stronger restrictions, signatory to Kyoto and so forth, has actually increased its emissions of CO2. So how, how does that factor into the debate? It factors in to the extent that most, what, what many people don't acknowledge that, but it has helped uh, our carbon dioxide emissions. And the, the key to fracking, I should say, it, um, is that it's likely, and key to natural gas, it's likely better than coal, but we're not 100% sure it's better. The key is how much methane is it leaks out during the production process. And it could be the, the case that so much methane uh, it leaks out 
um, that it makes, and, and methane is a huge uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gas, it could be the case that that makes natural gas and fracking worse than coal. Now, it's not likely. If you talk to scientists and others, and they're getting better, the industry is getting better at, um, at preventing um, um, too much methane from uh, emitting. But it could be the case that the leakage is such that it makes it worse. I don't think it is, but you have to raise that possibility. So uh, someone writes here, I, I worked as a roughneck and drilling engineer for George Mitchell. These wells don't last very long. Why do you see this as a long-term transformation rather than a Klondike-style boom followed by a bust a few years later? Yeah, so that's sort of the common argument. There's this view that it's a Ponzi scheme, that this whole era won't last long. And that's because, it's true, um, shale wells, the production dro drops dramatically. Starts off really strong and then drops dramatically. And people are like, aha, wow, this is all you know, smoke and mirrors and people are trying to sell stock and, 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 and cheat us all. Um, I'm not of that view. Um, I think that, I'm not sure, like Obama said, we're going to have 100 years of natural gas. Uh, I think we'll have a few generations worth and we're going to have a lot of crude for the next number of years. I don't think it's going on forever. But um, the reason I'm not as concerned is because when you talk to people in the fields, they say, Greg, we all know that. Well, we don't know that. Everyone knows that shale dr drops dramatically. But then it levels off nicely for uh, many years. And um, they're becoming much better in the fields, much more efficient. They're finding new formations. You know, it's a little bit like we talked about, a little bit like the, the view that we people used to have that we were running out of, you know, peak oil kind of thing. People just sort of extrapolate. But they're new innovations all the time and I'm very impressed by these guys. They find new formations. They're becoming much more efficient in drilling, drilling a lot of formations from just one single drill pad. Um, so I'm more encouraged about the future. I don't think it's going to go on forever, but um, we are in an era of energy uh, resurgence. We, we had uh, someone for, uh, at the Global Conference last year from the National Intelligence Council talking about what he called super fracking that there's new technology coming around or that the technology that they're using now is getting perfected and better and so forth. So yields could go quite a bit higher. Do, did you come across that as well? Um, to some extent, not as much, but some extent, yeah. That's okay. interesting. So um, there, are oh, there are over 500 chemicals in fracking fluid. The EPA tracks only 12. How can you be so confident that the fracking isn't causing cancer and other problems if we aren't even tracking from fracking? Um, well, Nice rhyme, by the way. <laughs> tracking from fracking. Um, I, I talked to scientists and they say the evidence isn't there yet. There's some isolated studies. Um, we'll see um, how many of them are proved out and borne out over time. Um, again, the water isn't getting into the water, it isn't from the fracking down below. Often what happens is, too often, uh, there are leaks, there are blowouts. Um, again, these guys um, make mistakes left and right, and we ha they have to be held accountable for them. Um, and it's my view that we got to work with them because we're, it's, it's hard to imagine our country. We're sitting on uh, some of the largest, literally two of the largest natural gas fields in the world. It's a lot to expect our country to say, yeah, we're sitting on these huge amounts, piles of oil and gas, but we're going to ignore them. We're not going to frack. We're going to keep shipping boatloads of money to people we really don't like that much. And we're still digging out of the largest economic downturn uh, since the Great Depression. So we are going to drill this stuff, and they already are drilling it. Better to work with these guys and to make sure they, 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 they do a better job of, of preventing blowouts and the leaks um, and the spills and the casing issues. And there are numerous problems, um, and, and I document them in my book. Um, there are water issues. It's hard to figure out um, the water issues because a lot of times the, in these areas, the water just, there's water, there are problems with the water even before the, the um, the fracking, but I, I document, and, you know, the same professor who says it's unlikely the chemicals are going to get into the water says that there are all kinds of issues in terms of uh, affecting the water and um, spills and getting into leaks, basically getting into, um, and other kinds of things, getting into the, into the water above the surface. So we've got to work much harder and put our energy, no pun intended, into, into putting pressure on the oil and gas guys rather than just hoping they go away and they're going to keep on making mistakes. And, and just by way of context, in 2008, uh, just before the, uh, the, the crash hit, the United States, uh, well, the, the world saw oil hit about 145 a barrel. At that point, given how much oil we were importing, we were on track to send a trillion dollars overseas mm -hmm. to pay for that fuel. So from an economic perspective, uh, that's a tremendous shift from a trillion 
uh, dollars going overseas to possibly none. Yeah. Uh, is any of the water used during the fracking process recovered? Uh, some is, and you've got the wastewater. They're doing a much better job, but um, you know, a lot of it's just sort of the incentive. They, they've got incentive to do a better job with the water and to uh, recycle. Like I said, Apache is at the cutting edge of doing that. I've, I've seen some interesting things that they're, they're working on. Other people, too. When you talk to private equity guys, when you talk to like the big money on Wall Street, they're betting on this stuff. They're trying to figure out ways to make money from it all and also from alternatives. I and mean, wind and solar, they all believe in wind and solar as, as our future. Um, we may have to really invest as a nation in the infrastructure for wind. We're not quite there. It's still intermittent. Both of them are. Um, but you know, you drive around the country, you see much more dependence on it, and the numbers suggest it too, which is not there yet. So the big money, uh, they're investing in wind and solar, investing on, on recovering and recycling uh, water, and hopefully they'll get there. Now, um, I've heard that uh, because the prices for natural gas are so low, two or three years ago we had 1,400 rigs drilling for fracking for natural gas. Now we have about four or 500 because they've been taken out of drilling for natural gas moved into oil. Mm -hmm. I, is that correct? Yeah, that seems right. Yeah, and, you know, they react to prices. And natural gas prices have come down, and crude is more of a global market, so it's, it's, it's held up nicely. So yeah, it's, um, they're, they're, they've shifted. So is there, it, it, could there be an effect where this tremendous resource doesn't really get exploited because there's so much of it? You mean natural gas? Natural gas. Yeah, plus we're burning. I mean, if you go to, um, North Dakota, it's pretty at night, but it's it's kind of disturbing. We burn so much natural gas because the infrastructure isn't there, the pipelines aren't there to, to ship it elsewhere, um, and they burn it. It's not horrible for the environment. It's not like leaking methane, but it's not great, and um, it's, it's it's wasteful. Um, so uh, we've got a lot of it. We will. It's not clear how much we 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 have uh, generations probably. And and as that slide showed, of course, this these fields extend up to Canada, mm -hmm. and and we had uh, someone at the global conference a couple of years ago say uh, who was involved in the business in Canada, saying that his biggest fear was running out of storage space for all this natural gas. There's so much of it. Yeah, the infrastructure issue is a big issue. That's why we're shipping them on rails, unfortunately, and that's why we've had some fires lately, and we're, it's, 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 it's sad, you know, the, the, and um, it's more combustible than we would have thought. So the infrastructure isn't quite there. So, you know, if you're looking to make some money, go build some uh, infrastructure so we don't have to take it by rail, things like that. Uh, so based on the benefits of fracking to facilitate U.S. energy independence, what practical government policies should we consider to prevent ecological water and other safety risks to the public? Mm, that's a good question. There are a lot of things we can do. It's sometimes surprising um, why we're not doing them. Um, there's, there should be better testing of the casing around wells, which is so crucial. I think it's... Um, and, and that casing is cement and steel. Steel, uh-huh. Um, I think Wyoming or Colorado recently initiated uh, a law that, they're gonna, that, they, that you need to test uh, periodically um, the, the casing to make sure uh, it's reliable. And they should, why, why aren't we doing that everywhere? I'm not sure. Methane leakage, we, don't, we still don't know how much is leaking. Um, we don't know for sure. The government should, EPA has done some work. They should, um, EDF thinks they should do more work. Um, there are a lot of things. I mentioned a few in my book. Um, EDF has a lot. EDF on the website, they have tons of recommendations and things that we should do. It's surprising we don't do more of it. And if, and if you think about the map, a lot of those fields go up into New York uh, State. So what's going on in New York? Uh, it seems that they can't make up their mind about what to do with or, the... Or one person can't make up his mind. Um, yes, Governor Cuomo might, um, might make a decision at some point. Um, we will see. He apparently um, favors gambling, um, but not um, hydraulic fracturing uh, upstate New York uh, in some very poor areas. Um, listen, if, if some areas, there's some beautiful parts of that state, some areas don't want to um, allow fracking, I'm, I, I completely support it. Um, it just let's, let's allow people to vote, let the communities decide for themselves, and um, and let's rely on science, make a, sci a decision. You know, Governor Brown seems to um, hew more to, the, to th that view. Let's, let's depend on what the science says and the studies and, and, um, and, and go slowly towards, towards uh, embracing it as opposed to just sort of um, kicking the can and, and not making a decision. So um, is the land reusable after fracking? Ah, so there's like this misunderstanding that it's not like um, ruined land. Um, after the fracking process, 
Um, you see kind of the, uh, maybe it's like uh, 75 yards worth of, 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 of a platform kind of thing. 50 to 100 yards maybe if I remember correctly, but the rest of the, you know, Pennsylvania is rolling beauty. So, um, yeah, some parts are affected, um, but uh, after the, the, the trucks, all the trucks, they tear up the road and, and, and cause traffic and, and noise pollution and all that kind of stuff with the fracking process, which takes about, uh, it depends how you define it, if you're bringing in the materials or not, let's say a month, I don't know. Um, then it, it, it doesn't look so bad. It looks pretty good, except for those kind of areas. And then you, you deal with the, the kind of 100 yards here. And then, but I've seen people live right next to it, and they're, they're, it looks pretty. And how about agriculturally? Mm. Can you still use the land for agriculture? Yeah, yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, there are farms in, in that area still. Um, you know, we'll see long term. I'm, I'm not um, naive. Um, I'm open to new studies, and they're still doing it. We, we have to remember, this is still relatively new. Yes, fracking has been since the 50s, but just uh, with this surge of production, especially in Pennsylvania, just since, you know, 2005-ish, let's say, um, it's really taken off. So, um, you know, I, I, we could see new studies that uh, undercut that view, but for now, um, there isn't a really um, reason for disturbance in terms of the, the farm animals. There are, there are one-off issues. I've seen horrible water, and I've seen um, mistakes. And like Cabot it was one of the first people in Pennsylvania, and they made tons of mistakes. And partly, partly it's because that part of the state, there hadn't been that much drilling. So um, they had been drilling elsewhere. They didn't really know the geology, and they screwed up left and right, and they made mistakes, and they owned up to it sometimes, had to bring in water. So they didn't make lots of mistakes. I don't want to suggest they didn't, but there's nothing inherent in the fracking process um, if you talk to the scientists. But uh, as long as it, it's done properly. So uh, how does the cost per BTU, British thermal units, of fracking compare to tar sand production? I'm not sure. Well, well tar sands is more oil, more crude. And I think we need about, about $60 a barrel for oil from shale. Um, tar sands, I'm not sure. I think they probably need maybe about 60, 70. I'm not 100 percent sure. It is uh, worse for the environment, their production, than our light sweet oil that comes from shale oil. Um, but you know, you want to go overboard there. So, so uh, looking at that, at, at those costs, we're, what about the the pipeline issue? Uh, for example, uh, the Keystone pipeline. Where, where do you come out on that? Well, Keystone at one point was much more important for the industry and for the country, um, but now it's taken so long that these entrepreneurs, these wildcatters, have adjusted by saying, all right, the pipeline's not coming, let's all ship it by rail, let's ship more of the stuff by rail, and guys like Warren Buffett have made a lot of money by investing in, in rails as a result. Um, so it, it would be helpful to some extent um, if it got approved. Um, it's more important to Canada, though, and... Um, if we don't, they may ship it. If we don't build it, then they may ship it to Asia. They're threatening us with that. Um, we'll see. There is, an, it'll be an impact to some extent on the environment. But as the State Department said, it'll be marginal. Um, how do how do you see public concerns dampening the opportunities for fracking? You know. If you talk to guys in the industry, the oil and gas guys, they're always whining. They're always whining. They're like, oh, Obama hates us, and they're putting up so many restrictions. We've got this remarkable surge, gone from 5 million to 9 million barrels. Harold Hammond's made $14 billion, but the guy criticizes Obama left and right. To me, that's really over the top. Um, so, <laughs> you know, they want to they want to drill everywhere, obviously. They want to drill on public lands, and um, we don't need to. We're moving towards energy independence, energy security. I call it energy security because we probably will always depend on people like Mexico and Canada, but who knows. Um, so dampening, I don't know, we're, we're doing fine without drilling on public lands, so I wouldn't worry about too much, guys. Now, there, there's a lot of associated investment uh, going into manufacturing, chemical industries, uh, and, and so forth around, around the country as a result. Uh, I, I've read that companies like Dow Chemical and, and others are moving big operations from the Middle East to the U.S. BASF, a big German chemical company, is moving lots of uh, operations here. Do you, you, you use the figure of two million jobs. Uh, is that direct, or are you talking about, uh, is that all of the jobs that are going to be created? What's, what's the impact on jobs? That's um, including chemicals moving, and all those industries moving people back here, and that's based on Ed Morris at uh, City, and they've been bullish and right um, for much of the, the past, you know, five, ten years. 
maybe they're wrong, but maybe it's an, maybe it's, it's an overstatement, but that's the estimate that, that they have. Um, and, you know, exports of, of, of um, natural gas will, are, are, are key, too. We should talk about that a little bit, um, and because the whole controversy there. Well, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just interesting that, um, that um, it, it's one of these things we wouldn't have expected a few years ago. One of the people in my book, Sharif Suki, is a key player in this, a key pioneer. And um, in, in some ways, um, he's more, one of the most unlikely characters in my whole book because he, um, he was an immigrant from Lebanon, a lot of immigrants, again, in my book, a lot of very American story. Immigrant from Lebanon, investment banker. He um, started out this company. Uh, he, before that, he, started, he was an investment banker, made some money, he retired or semi-retired, up, went up to Colorado to ski for a few years, ran out of money, started some restaurants and um, started the Mezzaluna restaurant uh, here. Remember that one with the O.J. Simpson? Um, so he owned the restaurant during that whole sad um, uh, um, uh, episode um, with O.J. Simpson. Uh, um, and uh, he got sick of it because uh, he was disgusted by that whole uh, yes, a period because um, tourists would come from all over the country after, the, after that, um, um, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were killed, to go to his restaurant to steal plates and, and take knives. And he was just disgusted by it. So he, he said, I'm going to start an energy company. He's a really smart guy. And he built a company called Chenier Energy to import natural gas into this country because all the experts said we were running out of natural gas. And um, they built these huge terminals in, in Louisiana. And then, uh, lo and behold, um, it turns out that we don't really need any na to import natural gas. We have a glut here. So his stock tumbled. And uh, it was really embarrassing for him. The stock um, he was, was so low that his own investors were giving up on him. And um, one day, he kind of said, wait, hold on a second. If we actually are going to have a glut of natural gas, thanks to these shale formations, then maybe instead of importing LNG, which is liquefied natural gas, which you can convert into natural gas. Instead of importing it, let's export it. And if you think about it, you know, he went to his board and, and with the idea, if you think about it, he spent years telling his board, his investors, the Wall, Wall Street, everybody, that we were running out of natural gas. And he's like, oh, you know that whole thing about running out of natural gas? No, 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 no. We're actually, we actually have a glut. We're going to export it. And he basically, they, his investors at that point were like, whatever, Sharif, the stock's at one, good luck. You know, we gave up on you, know, like Blackstone, some of the big money on Wall Street. And uh, he got it, he, he did it. He got the export licenses before anybody else and figured out how to refit um, at these big terminals and borrow billions. And now the stock's soared and he's worth like $350 million. And he's, his company's gonna be the first one in the, in the lower states um, to begin uh, exporting natural gas next year. So, and that's gonna um, change a lot, it'll be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> now, now there, there's a lot of controversy about exporting natural gas, and I don't know whether it's all settled, is it, as to whether or not uh, it's, producers are free to export as much as they want, or is it regulated in terms of how much they can export? It's not settled. On one-off basis, they're approving certain companies to export LNG, the, uh, natural gas. The, the argument by Dow Chemical, as you mentioned, and others, is that we're sending away all this cheap natural gas. We've got this uh, surge of production. We're all paying less uh, to w warm our homes, and, and companies are paying less. So why are we sending it all away? I would argue, I would answer that um, it's a little hypocritical of us to talk about free trade, about every, everything but... Uh, energy. So if people want to export it, you know, maybe, and, and it's not clear whether it will raise prices or not. I know instinctively it sounds like you send away some supply, it'll increase things. But as Joel suggested, we have a lot in the ground. So it's not clear. I've seen different studies. It, people don't know how much it's going to affect um, prices or not. So we're going to, and you can create a lot of jobs um, with these approvals I've seen, at least some studies, some estimates. So we're going to have more companies trying to export natural gas, Exxon and other kinds of people, and um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. So, so do you think uh, right now Europe is dependent on Russia for its natural gas? Uh, do you see the United States uh, competing with Russia to sell natural gas to Europe? Yeah, to some extent, yeah. We see, it will be interesting to see how much they can do. Um, the whole geopolitics, that gets the geopolitics and how Russia's impacted, how OPEC's going to be impacted. You're already seeing with the Ukraine, people vying on um, both sides. A lot of that is energy related. It's going to affect all kinds of things. And Russia's got its own shell, um, but they, um, they, they do uh, have a stranglehold in some places of, in, in Europe and uh, dependent on, on that. And they are afraid of our resurgence and whether we'll be competing with them, at least at the margin. So um, as technology improves, uh, have companies gone back to refract previous areas? Yeah, yeah. Again, the, the technology, it's a technology story. And uh, they're innovating and, and, and doing a better job, becoming more efficient all the time. And they go back and refract, yeah.
And um, if, if we get back to the, to the geopolitical parts, do you ever expect, uh, if there is exporting, that these huge price differentials between, say, Europe or Japan or China and the U.S. will uh, even out? So maybe we'll have a 7 or $8 global standard? Uh, it, it won't be because of our exports. We're not going to export that much. It will be if people like the UK and Poland and Argentina and Mexico, Mexico can figure out how to tap their own shell formations. And we get, um, and you, you could really spit a scenario, a really bullish scenario, where you get all this um, added supply in this, in this globe. And the really interesting arguments of why demand, you know, my whole book really is about supply, but demand is really changing also in this country. More people living in cities. Um, as I suggested, we're going to have I think like close to 55 mile per hour cars soon. Um, our dependence and our use um, on, on oil is going down, efficiency, we're becoming more efficient. Um, you know, our population is gonna keep increasing, so that's not gonna help matters. But globally, we're becoming a little less dependent and a little more efficient when it comes to oil and gas um, uh, demands, which is kind of interesting. So that, that could affect things too. So are, are there questions uh, from the audience here, more questions? Uh, could, can we get the microphone over here? Right here. Yep. Oh, uh, okay. we, uh, if you could wait till we get the microphone. Sorry. But they haven't. Yeah, it's right, right there. Here you mind. Okay. Uh, have they found a really practical solution to, to the disposal of the used fracking water, which I believe is quite toxic, and they're having problems, and uh, it's reusable, but only for a certain number of times, and then they have to dispose of it. Yeah. They're making progress, but no. I mean, um, they've done a better job of holding it and containing it so that it doesn't leak as much. They used to have leaks and, um, and issues there, um, but they still re-inject, and, um, and they, they don't have great solutions. But that's why they're trying to do things like uh, recycling and become a little more efficient there. Well, how are they holding it? Are they in, holding it in tanks? or um, Metal kind of encase things, and then they ship it off to inject it elsewhere. And then you hope that it doesn't. I mean, they've, again, they've gotten better, but they've been kind of holes and, and such um, that there's been spills and, and leaks and that kind of thing. And, and right behind you. Uh, does fracking produce just natural gas, or is there any oil produced? No oil. Yeah, yeah. All this whole thing we talk about oil is fracking too. Fracking creates uh, oil. First, people thought no way natural gas, and they said all right, natural gas, but no way oil. But then they they proved they could do oil as well. Yeah. Thank you. Now, now, what about um, using natural gas in vehicles directly? Is that a possibility? Yeah, there are all kinds of people working on that. Um, there are all kinds of issues. It's better for things like fleet, where they all return to one spot at the end of the day. And, um, you know, I've seen great data showing that if we could just get the truck fleet in this country to convert to natural gas, then um, our, our uh, imports will grow, will, our dependence on oil will, will drop. Um, it'll help the environment. There are all kinds of great things that can happen. There are people working on that stuff, yeah, entrepreneurs and others. Other questions uh, uh, down here in front? Uh, uh, thanks for writing your uh, we, have, uh, we want you to have the microphone here. In 2013, MIT and Harvard published studies that show that fossil fuels account for $886.5 billion of health care costs. And I just wonder how you can be, and the Wall Street Journal can be so enthusiastic about fossil fuels when you're not taking into account externalities. And if you just look at water, there's no water need for solar photovoltaics. And healthcare costs, this is a, a catastrophe. And I'm the person who worked for Mitchell Energy and Development. So I, I paid my way through MIT with checks from George Mitchell. So I didn't start that way. But when I hear you say how the land looks fine and you can grow, you a Joel, you asked a great question. Can you grow food on it? You can't. We've drilled over six million wells, and they leave behind football field size poisonous, toxic moonscapes. And how can you not be bothered by all the poisoning of Americans to the tune of almost a third of all health care costs? It's worse than asbestos. OK. Um, um, let's, uh, let's, let's have uh, Greg answer that. Yeah, better. so Joel's question, I think, was about the areas. And the areas still have farms, and they're doing fine. Um, but that where they've produced, I agree, that's, it's different. That, kind of uh, 100 yards or so. Um, listen, I'm of the view, I'm looking for a great quote from uh, Todd Mitchell, George Mitchell's uh, son. I'm of the view that um, this isn't ideal. 
And I can't speak to the Wall Street Journal. You lump in me and Wall Street Journal. Um, I, I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, but um, this is my book. Um, this is not ideal. Um, I'm hoping that this is um, going to be what the environmentalists thought or hoped, expected, until around 2006 or so, and that uh, it'll give us a time to do research on alternatives, because we're not yet ready to depend on alternatives, if you talk to, to most people. Um, it, are there externalities? For sure. Um, should it, there be a tax, maybe, on an energy uh, to pay for those? Sure. Um, but I'm not sure we have much of a choice, unfortunately. We use oil and gas. It's nothing to do with fracking, per se. So you don't like oil and gas. Okay. So. I, I'm a big fan of nuclear, but people don't like nuclear either. Um, a lot of people don't like wind now. You know, there's this new phenomenon where people are concerned about health uh, issues, about people living near wind turbines. Other people don't like that they kill birds. Other people don't like that they're ugly and eyesore. Um, I'm a big fan of wind, but th those are issues. No one wants that in your, their backyard either. Um, solar is intermittent, and we're not yet at the point. We don't have the infrastructure. We could potentially get there. So I'm of the view that this is not ideal, but hopefully it buys us some time. And so I'm going to look for this quote. But um, Todd Mitchell, the son of, of George Mitchell, I don't know if you, do you know Todd at all? Do you ever meet Todd? So listen, the whole um, Mitchell family, um, they're all about sustainability, and they're all about um, about this theme. And I kind of subscribe to this theme that, it's helped the country. Net net's been a positive, but only if it buys us some time to do research that we can make a transition. So he thinks uh, he says as follows, and I put it in my book. I think it will be clear in decades or more that extracting hydrocarbons from tight shale formations blew up all previous assumptions about the availability and economics of oil and gas development. What's hard to understand is how good a thing that is. So. I think it's a net net positive. I hope it's a net net positive, but only if it buys us some time. As you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy and most environmentalists said until around 2006, 2007, um, and I'm still of that view. So um, we can't have a debate. Well, Congress can, but we can't have a debate where the choices are um, all of the above or none of the above. So what what is the prudent policy going forward, how, how, how would, what would you recommend? Put more pressure on these guys to stop with the casing issues, to stop leaking, to um, test the water before, during, after, clamp down on them, find them a little bit more, um, but not, not discourage them, continue this process towards uh, energy independence. Greg, we'll take one more question. One more question. Uh, who has the microphone? Okay, right, right over here. It's coming right there. Yeah. The fracking that's being done off the coast in the um, coastal waters uh, of California, um, I believe all that fracking fluid is uh, just uh, emitted into the ocean. Is, is that right? I apologize. I'm not an expert in that area. I'm a land, land, main, main, main shore uh, expert, and, and or I've written about a book about the guys doing it in America. But yeah, I didn't get up. To, they, my guys didn't do that, so I don't know. <laughs> so um, well, that that's it. I want to thank Greg Zuckerman. Uh, you wrote a very <laughs> wonderful book, and um, he'll now sign the books. Uh, for those of you. And I'd be glad to continue the conversation. I love and talking and debating and um, getting critiques and um, want to keep writing better stuff. So I'll be here to, to sign and to talk to people. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks.